to all ask questions. Are eyebrows considered facial hair? I've always wondered, do vegetarians eat animal crackers? If a number two pencil is so popular, why is it still number two? Do bald people get dandruff? Why are power outages reported on TV? That makes no sense. But some questions are more meaningful than others. How do I handle all the stress in my life? How do I discover God's will for my life and live it out every day? I have a hard time dealing with disappointment. What does the Bible say I should do? How can I be the parent my kids need me to be and the one God wants me to be? What does the Bible say about dealing with difficult people? Because I know some. Are we actually living in the end times? What does that mean for me? So we turn to the one who has all the answers. We'll examine some of our biggest questions and discover God's best plan. Why? Because you asked for it. All right, we're on our sixth week on You Asked For It, and I, didn't, I meant to mention the last service that what you asked for, it's all about. Easter Sunday, we gave over 700 surveys out to everybody. We had a great response back, and we collected all these surveys. We do it on Easter Sunday because it's when everyone shows up at once. So it's a lot of fun. So everyone shows up at once. We give a survey, ask a bunch of questions about some future things in the church. But one of the things we ask is, what are some things you would like to hear about? And so the, uh, we, this is now the sixth week. Some of the things we talked about is how do I deal with stress and all those types of things. Today, we're dealing with something that no one has trouble with. And it's called how to deal with difficult people. <laughs> That's today. So but when you leave here today, you're going to be perfect in that. And, and the next week is our closing of the series. We're gonna, how, are we living in the end days? And if so, how are we supposed to live in the end days? So we're going to talk about when Christ is going to come back. We're going to give dates. We're going to let you know when you need to pack your bags. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to know all that. Okay, if anyone tells you that, you know the false prophet. The Bible says no one knows a day or time. However, there are things going on in our world today that has never happened before, and the Bible talks about There's many, many prophecies. So next week, we're going to be looking at that. What are you and I supposed to do in these last days? And so I really want to encourage you. I know it'll be an exciting time, and I'm looking forward. I've been studying this for a long time. I think about 47 years I've been studying it, so you don't want to miss out on that. That's next week. But today is how to deal with difficult people. I don't know about you, but it just seems to me that there seems to be people out there that their sole purpose in life is to irritate me. <laughs> their job is to make me go crazy. Do you have anyone like that in your life? It's like, why did God put this person? It's like a fly or a mosquito. What's the purpose of this person? All they do is irritate me, right? And they're driving me absolutely crazy. It's like they have a spiritual gift. They're missionaries of misery. Uh, no matter, you know, you know, anyone know people like that? Hope you're not married to one of them. But, you know, I think a lot of us can, and can ascertain that we do deal with difficult people, don't we? And I have news for you. You might be the person that's the difficult one. Everyone's going, I'm glad they're here today. If you say, I'm glad they're here today, you're probably the person that is the problems. But we all deal with difficult people. And the truth be known, you are sometimes that difficult person. And I heard a pastor say to me, I, I love the church if it wasn't for people. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, that's what the church is. So you're going to have people in your life that literally get you to the point where you don't think you can take another moment of this person. If this person shows up, maybe you go to work and there's this one person at work. You can have the best day in the world. You can close sales. You can, get, you can even have a birthday cake and eat it. All right. And this person will come in and they'll say something. Oh, I can't stand that person. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You know, this happens to everybody. And, 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 and there's people that just seems like that's all, they kind of get the crazy going in you, right? Well, I have news for you. Sometimes there are people in this world that are going to push every single button that says irritate. They're going to push every single one. And the question is, how do we deal with difficult people? Because you're going to find difficult people. And because people are imperfect. We live, I don't know if you realize this, we live in an imperfect world. And no matter how great you try to be, someone is going to mess up. You saw what happened last night with the Mets. A routine grounder. He misses it and they lose the game. Praise God. I think, God, I think God's a Yankee fan. That's why they call it the, the cathedral. Anyhow, but um, people are going to mess up. And you're going to mess up. And the truth of the matter is, that sometimes you're that person. 
You might look in the mirror and say, yeah, I'm difficult sometimes. We all are. How do we deal with people like that? How do we manage people that will literally push all of our buttons? How do we deal with difficult people? Well, the Bible is so wonderful because it talks about these issues you and I face. If you want to put it on the screen, if you have your Bibles, we can do it on the screen as well. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 23 to 26. This is the Apostle Paul, the older, more statesman. He's getting along in years, and he's talking to a young preacher named Timothy and giving him some advice, and he gives him good advice. Look what it says here. It says, again, I say, he's talking to Timothy, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. I think if you and I would just do that alone, how many folks know, you want to talk about politics, you get in foolish arguments, that's why I stay away from them, I don't deal with them because you know what, I don't run that because I have too many opinions. Okay, so stay away from foolish arguments, like who's going to win the World Series, it's not worth getting a fight over, all right? A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. Be able to teach, and listen to this, and be patient with, be patient with who? Difficult people, that's correct. Isn't that wonderful that the Bible tells us how to be patient with difficult people? Because no matter what you do, there will be difficult people, no matter where you go, no matter what you do. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap, for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. You know, there's a place here, listen, do the best you can. Sometimes you just gotta let people go and let God deal with them. It's not your job to straighten everyone out. I don't know if you realize that. It's not your job to straighten everyone out, okay? Now, there's a major point I wanna bring to your attention today, something that I heard all my life. My parents told me all this, and it's true. I don't know who coined the phrase, but it's true. You can't control what a person does to you, but you sure can control what you do with it. And this is the big, this is the big, this is the big, thing, the ditty, if you will, would be this. It's not what happens to you. It's what happens in you. It's not what happens to you. It's what happens in you is the most important thing. So the first thing we need to do, if we're going to deal with difficult people, we first of all need to deal with ourselves first because you're the one that has to respond to it. Otherwise, you're going to react instead of responding. When you react and I react, normally we make the wrong choices, don't we? I can't believe I said that. I'm so sorry, because you reacted. We have to learn to respond. And I wish I could tell you this morning that I have got this thing figured out. I may have it figured out theoretically, but I'm still working like the rest of you on this. This is not easy. But I will tell you this. I think one of my greatest strengths is I know that I'm weak. <laughs> and, and that's a good place to begin, that none of us are perfect. So the drive me crazy people. How do you deal with the drive me crazy people? Well, the truth is this. No one can drive you crazy unless you let them. Let me say that again. This is a revelation for you. No one can drive you crazy unless you let them. In our society today, we have really got away from Harry Truman. He used to say, the buck stops here. Now it's everyone else's fault all the time. You notice that? It's time to take personal responsibility for how you feel about a person. No one can make you feel anyway. It's a choice that you and I make. Now, I'm not suggesting it's easy. What about people being tortured and they met, I understand that. I understand there's temptations that face our way to get us to a place where our patience runs thin. But ultimately, we have to get rid of the lie that people choose how you feel. People don't choose how you feel. You and I choose how we feel. One of the first things I learned in marriage counseling way back is this. And I learned this and I teach people this all the time. Your spouse does not, you don't go, to, you make me angry. No, when you... Leave the, when you leave the bicycles in the garage and I can't pull in in a rainstorm, I find myself getting irritated and I choose to get agitated. That's more better than saying, you make me crazy, you leave those bikes in the middle of the garage and I have to get out and get wet. Or you leave the dishes in the sink or whatever it could be. You squeeze the toothpaste from the middle. I got a problem with that. <laughs> All right. The truth is, you allow somebody. Listen, can we do this today? If, if nothing else comes out of this today, this will be enough. Understand, you take responsibility for how you respond. Stop blaming other people for your decisions. I'm sorry. You decide if someone gets you irritated or not. 
It's not what happens to you, it's what happens in you. That's correct. Mom and dad, thank you for that. I owe you a part of the credit today for teaching me that. And we're trying to teach our kids that. And boy, oh boy, I never realized this before. And we have son, Luke, and we have Matthew, and we have a daughter named Hannah who's my little princess. I love her so much. But man, the drama that she goes through in grammar school. Oh my goodness. I thought guys were tough. These girls are ruthless to it. These little grammar school girls are unbelievable. I mean, wow. I can't get over it. I'm like, honey, don't worry about it. One day you're your friend, and then they talk about that, and then they, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, you know what? It's not what happens to you. It's what happens in you. I'm trying to drill into my kids now so they don't have to waste themselves for 40 or 50 years and finally get it when they're 80. Because what happens is then you become, basically, you become trolled by everybody else, and you have no control whatsoever, and it's not a good thing to be. The truth is this, no one can drive you upset, make you upset, unless you let them, the buck stops with you in regards to how you respond. No, I'm not suggesting it's easy. And, uh, and, and Jesus made us a promise. When Jesus makes us a promise, it's what? A promise. This is what Jesus has to say. I didn't put it in your scriptures today, you just believe me, look it up later. He says, he says in this world, he says, you will have trouble. He also says it's impossible that there should be no offense. When Jesus says it's impossible that there won't be an offense, that means it's impossible that there won't be a offense. He says offenses will come. As long as you're in this body living on this planet, or even if we go to Mars, and those are people, there's going to be an offense. Someone is going to offend you. If it's your mom, it's your dad, it's your spouse, it's your kids, it's your brothers or sisters, it's your pap, whatever. I guarantee you, I'm going to offend you. Imagine that. Yes, I will offend you. Why? Because I'm a human being. Now, it doesn't give me an excuse to be, to be um, sloppy, though I am at times. I'm going to offend you and you're probably going to offend me. Let's just get over it. It's going to happen. This is life. Don't be surprised when people do things that irritate you. We live in an imperfect world. You're not perfect. I, I, for some of you, that's a revelation. I'm like, I'm so glad to hear it today. Okay. It's probably you. I'm telling you if you think that. There is no utopian in any relationship. And by the way, there's no perfect church. I have a piece of advice for you today. If, if, if it's your first time here or whatever, and you come in, wow, this church is perfect. Do me a favor. Leave as fast as you can because you might ruin it. There is no perfect church. Okay? So stop, stop hopping everywhere. It's not, there's not going to be one. I'm going to do something. They're going to, music's going to out or whatever. I, something's going to happen. It's going to irritate you. It's just the way it is. But this is what you have to understand. Before you can deal with those difficult people, you need to look in the mirror and deal with you. That's correct. The person in the mirror, the man or the woman in the mirror is the person you need to deal with. Before you can deal with anybody else, you got to deal with you. And I have to deal with myself. And the problem with that is no matter where you go, you take you with you. And maybe you're the difficult person. Well, you got to deal with it. So you got to do that first. And I, I, I just... Um, Something else, I, I, see people think, I wish I could control people, but I can't. <clears throat> trying to control people is like trying to control cats. It just doesn't happen. You just can't control cats. As a matter of fact, I'm sorry, I, I know a little thing about cats. <laughs> but I was reading in USA this morning, USA Today, <laughs> there's a study, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> there's a study out there, and you look at it today, don't look at it now saying that they've done studies and they believe that your cat would kill you if it could. <laughs> Dogs don't do that. <laughs> okay, it's a funny study. Okay, that's nothing better, okay. Um, but let me, let me encourage you something. When you get irritated, I wanna encourage you to do something. This is something that has saved me a lot of, a lot of hassle. When I'm irritated, I usually ask, I, I stop. Usually if I try to stop, unless it's late at night. I lose my pay. Say, so God, I, I ask a question. I stop. Okay, why am I agitated that this person said, hi, why did that bother me so much? Why, why did I find myself going crazy? Or how about this? And this has happened more times than I like to admit. There was a time that I was driving in a vehicle. Imagine that. And there was this guy behind me that was trying to pass me. 
And unfortunately, I don't know what it is about me, but I like to be competitive. <laughs> I think I'm in the Grand Prix or something. No, 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 you're not. You know, I'm sitting there and, you know, and I, I was kind of hot dogging a little bit and there's no police here this morning, is there? Okay, so I finally got there and the guy was agitated with me. I mean, really, I mean, really, and I was enjoying myself a little. He got really agitated with me and then he pulled up next to me and he gave me some sign language. <laughs> He didn't go one way to God. He did another one way to someplace else, okay? And, and, and all of a sudden, and I, I tell you, I, okay, listen, I, I have to be honest with you here. I, I'm Italian and German. Gestapo and mafia put together. That's scary. And I grew up in Long Island, New York. You don't mess with a New Yorker. So I wanted to get out of the car and I wanted to lay hands on them. But, I, you know, wait, 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 wait. I said, wait a minute. What am I doing? This is silly, God. I shouldn't be doing this. I'm a child of you. Who cares? I let it go. Let it go. Let it go. I got kids. It's a great song. We should sing it here in church. Let it go. Um, I don't care anymore, right? Wherever the lyrics are. So, you know, I, I made a choice not to get upset. And I just smiled like this. I smiled at the guy. Let him go. You know, I mean, it's people that are shooting each other on the highway. It's insane. Over what? Right? Well, that's a vivid example. You know what I think my theory is? I don't want to get too off track here, but I think what happens is you and I are so frustrated and we're, we're wrapped so tight that when we have an opportunity to let out some steam and we think no one's looking, we think when we're in a car, like we're immune. <laughs> we're not immune, okay? So we have to ask ourselves the question, why does this person agitate me? Some, why do I want to check myself into a mental institution when this person comes around? Why is it? What do they do that is making me upset? Ask yourself that question. And, and, and the first thing you want to do is this. I can't believe they did that. Guess what happened? Or you just want to text somebody. You know what? Sometimes we do that because we want to get a posse together. We want to get a, a lynch mob together to lynch that person, don't we? How about we stop it and say, God, what is it? The Bible says, search me, know me, try me and see my anxious thoughts. Ask God, why is this person bothering me? Because you feel like they're disrespecting you and you're insecure in your job. Oh, okay. Why is it when I meet that person that just had, and a lot of folks are having babies around here, we appreciate that. <laughs> and I, when we first had our child, the mothers came together. What percentile is your child in? You know that question, what percentile? Well, mine is 100% with the head. Yeah, I know your baby's head has a huge head. No. But you know, you, 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 people ask what percentile are they in? And, they, and, they, and, and now they, they're in school and what are, they, what are they doing? Are they on the honor roll? And, and all this type of competition, you're like, oh, I can't believe. And what happens is we feel insecure about being a parent and we're not quite sure our kids measure up. We're insecure about it. Instead of dealing with that and growing up, we said, I can't stand that person. And you're the person that, that can't, every time you see that, that bumper sticker that says, my child's in the honor roll, yeah, well, my child can beat up your child in the honor roll. I mean, we get, we get upset, right? Why? Because we have insecurity inside of us. So why not ask yourself the question, why am I getting agitated with this person? Why? And, and you know, the people that we're closest to, we often get the most agitated with. Why is it when a person, the way they chew their food at the table, I, I'm ready to lose my mind you know what <laughs> and you know well that usually means there's something else going on there's probably a, a, a frustration in your relationship you have not dealt with and so the little slurp on that soup bowl is driving you mad because there's something else going on why not grow up Get yourself off the table and ask God, God, why is this bothering me? If you guys would just do that and I would do that more, I have found many times. I, I said, you know, get over yourself. You're insecure because this guy has a bigger church than you. You feel a little insecure. So you think he's bragging. No, you're insecure. Get over yourself. Build a bridge. I'm like, God, forgive me. You know what? And I say, you know what? Yeah, I'll let it go. Who cares if that person thinks they're in charge of the church? They're not. God is. Let them think that. It's not worth it to me to get upset over and so that's the first thing you need to do. Remember, it's not what happens to you. It's what happens in you, all right? And um, go to God. Go to God. Don't go, go to yourself. Go to God. And maybe sometimes you might get a trusted man or woman who's mature and that will give you right advice, not give you advice about buying some kind of a weapon, okay? Hebrews 12, 14 to 15 says this. It says, pursue 
Argument. No. Pursue what? Peace. And by the way, uh, pursue means pursue. It means longing, going after. It's like a policeman trying to catch you when you speed. <laughs> He's pursuing. Put the lights on, put the siren on, and pursue peace. Because peace does not come easy. You have to pursue peace with some people. No, what does it say? I don't like this thing. All people. Even the people that irritate you. The people that don't look like you, smell like you, act like you. People with different political persuasions. People with different orientations. What do you do then? Love everybody. You may not like them, but you have no right to get hate in your heart. Because that's not of God. So what do we need to do? Pursue peace with, you may not agree with somebody, but pursue peace with all people. You're never going to win someone by being mean. And holiness. You know what holiness means? The right way of doing things. Holy, right, God's way. Without which no one will see the Lord. If you don't do, if we don't pursue peace and holiness, people are not going to see God. They're going to see you. You're going to get in the way of God. I don't want to get in the way of God. I want to be like a good um, usher that will open the door here. Come on here. Come right in here to over here. This is the theater. This is God. Come meet God. I don't want to get in the way and sit there and be a jerk. And people can't even, I said, I'm not going to go in there. The, the usher's a jerk. Why do that when God has great things for us? Okay? And listen to this. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Listen to this. Looking careful lest anyone shall fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, by this many will be defiled. There's something called the bitterness weed. It is, it is amazing. This little thing pops up. Ah, oh, it's just a little weed. No, that little thing has a root system that will strangle a walnut tree. I and mean, that thing comes around, and the next thing you know, you don't deal with that bitterness, it starts to just take a hold of you, and it will rob the life out of the things that used to give you life. Bitterness does you no good. And we're going to talk a little bit more about it towards the end of our time today. But bitterness is a toxin that will, will make you sick emotionally, physically, relationally, and perhaps even financially. It will get to you. I can't stand that person. And when you think that, there's like a thing in your stomach and you start feeling anxious. And like, I've got to take a stiff one just to take the edge off. I'm really, I'm really anxious about this. Well, let it go. Why bother? Why, why let bitterness happen? Well, how do you deal with it? We'll talk about that in a few moments. And the Bible says something very, very important. It says, Proverbs 4, 23. It says, above all else. When the Bible says above all else, it means above all else. Guard your heart. You ever see a soccer player? They had this huge goal, and they got to sit there like this, and they got to watch. And they're watching the field, and they're waiting for that ball to come. And they're, they're going to guard that thing so the ball doesn't pass through. My friends, that's how we have, we have to guard our heart. Because what gets in your heart stays in your heart. you got to guard this thing. It's the most important thing in your life. Because once it gets bitter, the rest of you gets bitter. Your health will go bad. Your relationship will go bad. Your whole life will become miserable. Do you want your life to be miserable? I don't. So the Bible says, above all else, guard your heart. Why? For it's the wellspring of life. It's the, it's the water that comes out of it that feeds all the things of your life. If it's polluted, all your plants in your life, all the fruit of your life will be, will be poisoned. And when I grow well, it's not worth it. Guard your heart from bitterness. Bitterness will strip the life out of you. And yes, it will even take years off of your life on the planet Earth because your health will be compromised. They've done studies on this. Give yourself a test about these people. And something else, don't go with your initial gut. Well, I'm really good at reading people. I hear this all the time. I'm really good. I could tell that they thought that. Really? Yeah. I'm really good at, I'm really good. Everyone thinks they're good at people. Everyone thinks they can read people. Have you noticed that? Oh yeah, I know what they meant. Really? You really know what they meant? And, and I think the, probably the worst thing is this, if you're involved with a relationship, such as uh, you have parents or uh, a brother or sister, or if you're married, this happens a lot. Sometimes I think I know exactly what Sandra's thinking. And I don't. I get it wrong. She knows what I'm thinking, though. <laughs> but I'll assume things. You know, I'll assume all that. Oh, so you're home now. And you hear, you hear something. So we've learned that we often mishear each other. And, we have to, and what happens is as soon as you hear something, you put up your dukes, right? You're ready to fight. And you're not listening anymore. That might just be something. What would happen if we chose to be understood rather than to be I mean, excuse me, we chose to understand instead of being understood. 
And this happens all the time. We assume things all the time, don't we? Most of the time, I have found, most of the arguments I've had with people, whether it be from my family, to people at the church, often it's over misunderstandings. It really is. We just think, stop putting so much confidence in your ability to know what another person's thinking. Only God really knows what's in a person's heart. Yeah, there's evidence we can pick on, but you, put, you and I put way too much stock in our ability to know people. I'm a good person reader. No, you're not as good as you think you are. Only God is the ultimate judge. So can you lay off a little bit? Okay, this is what I, what I encourage you to do with annoying people. Ever come to a blinking yellow light? What happens then? You, you gotta take, be careful, right? If the light's yellow, some of you floor it and kick it down and you get through. Some of you other will slow down. Yellow, it's not quite red or not quite green. Okay, when you think you know how a person is, it's a yellow light. Okay, keep it in mind, but it's not factual. You can, can, if we could just do that alone, we'd save ourselves a lot of problems. Stop thinking you know what's in a person's heart. You do not know what is in a person's heart. You're not God. I know for some of you that's really surprising. You're not God. You don't know all. I don't know all. All right? You're not as good as reading people as you think. So the first thing we're going to do, I spent a lot of time on this first point because it's perhaps the most important point, is this. Is ask yourself what is happening to you. It's not what happens to you. It's what happens in you. And ask yourself the question, what's going on? The, the major second point here this morning is this. Our reaction often determines what comes back to us. If you don't like what you're getting back, uh, look at what you're dishing out. What are you putting out? I didn't say anything. I just said, hmm, nice dress. <laughs> do that to, oh, man. <laughs> oh, don't you do that to a little girl or, you know, or you know, these, these girls in the school, nice dress. Huh? Now, that's really smart of you. I mean, that, that, that just gets to somebody. I, well, I said it wasn't very smart. Yeah, but the way you said it, you had a lot of attitude. You got a little spin on that thing, you know? It, it, you get people. Often our reaction determines what comes back to us. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, 1 and 2, says a sarcastic answer turns away wrath. <laughs> and is that what it says? No. A soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. And listen to this, the tongue of the wise, you wanna be wise, the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pulls foolishness. I'm gonna ask Matt, Matt, you come up here, I'm gonna put you in the spot. You go on this side, please, okay. I'm gonna have a little catch, okay? I'm not very good at sports, but Okay, this is an example of an argument. Okay, he, I'm gonna pretend you're somebody that uh, I'm having a hard time with. I can't imagine that. He's one of the nicest guys you ever wanna meet, seriously. And if you ever need, your, ever need any therapy, he's a physical therapist, he'll take care of you. Uh, give me $100 afterwards, please. Okay, all right. And, anyhow, so imagine this. Imagine I, I, I come home, and imagine I'm irritated with, um, let's say, it's your, it's your, maybe it's my brother or something, and uh, I come back and I say, you know, you really don't appreciate all the hard work I do in this business. And, and you would say, what do you mean? I work real hard here, who do you think you are? Well, you just come late, you do what you wanna do all the time, you don't care about this company, all you care about is yourself, you know what? I'm really agitated with you. And then he says to me, no, he's too nice to say that, you're just a jerk. You know, I'm sick of you, who do you think you are? You think you run this office? I've been here 10 years, you've been here 10 months. You know, I've had enough of you. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Now, see that's happening? I'm throwing it to him. He's throwing it to me. As long as we keep the catch going, it's going to happen. Now, some of you are saying, well, I don't do that. Yeah. There's something that begins to happen. Now, what happens if he, what happens is this. Some of you may not be verbal back, but you do something. You stay here. Don't leave yet, please. Okay. It's this. Ever hear of the mute button? Oh, it's powerful. Yeah. I didn't say anything. You know, the silent treatment, the ice treatment, boy, you know what, I've known people that do that. They won't speak to you for days. Well, you know what that is? That's throwing the ball back, it is. Because you, what you're doing is you're just throwing it back to him again, he's a good catch. What's happening is, that even the silent treatment, if it's done in the wrong way, can be a way to kind of jab it to it. So what happens now, if he says, you know what, I'm, I'm sick of you, and I'll throw it back to me again. Listen, I'm, I'm so sorry you feel that way. And so I'm going to take this ball. I'm going to say, I'm not going to throw it back. I want to, 
But instead, Jesus is right over here. Jesus, you know what? You know what? They offended you a lot, didn't they? So you know, I'm going to take it here. I'm sorry you feel that way, Matt. I'm sorry that I did that. I'm sorry that I gave you those things. Now throw me another ball. You're full of baloney. You're just saying that. You don't care about you, you. You think you run the company. You know, I'm sorry you feel that way. I can see why you might feel that way, Matt. I, I'm so sorry. And oh, oh. Okay. What I want to do is take the thank you. you get get out of here. Okay. No. All right. Thank you. Here's a good sport. Um, there's an example. You see, as long as you play catch, it's going to happen. And the silent treatment for those of you who use the ice treatment. Some of you are Dr. Ice. You haven't spoke to your spouse in days or weeks, or your brother or your sister. I know people haven't spoken to their family member for, for years. That's, that's the same as throwing a dart back at somebody, the ice treatment. Why not realize that you're imperfect and I'm imperfect? We're all imperfect. And realize there's only one perfect person, and that's God. Okay, that's a part of it. You know, David Wilkerson, who wrote the book called The Cross and a Switchblade, tremendous book written in 19-something, 68, I believe it was, he's found a wonderful organization called Teen Challenge, which is now around the world. We support them, incidentally, here in New Haven and the areas. It's a drug rehab center. Well, he went into um, Bedford Stuyvesant area of, of, of Brooklyn, a really bad area, back in the early, uh, late 50s, early 60s, and there was a problem, an epidemic of heroin and gang violence Latin kings and all these types of uh, things were going on. There was this guy, a, a, a leader of the gang called Nicky Cruz. And this guy, Nicky Cruz, they had a, the book was called Switch, Crossing a Switchblade. David Wilkerson felt compelled after seeing a newspaper article about these young teenagers being in, in, incarcerated and getting in trouble. Well, he went down there and he tried to make a difference. A skinny preacher from Pennsylvania. I mean, as white as you get. The guy is no street smarts at all. And he goes to the inner city and he's working with these kids. And he tells Nicky Cruz, says, I'm going to cut you up in a thousand pieces. You know what David Wilkinson says? And every single piece is going to say that God loves you and so do I. Nicky Cruz began to melt. Nicky Cruz now is an evangelist. He gave his life to Christ. David Wilkinson found one of the greatest drug rehab centers in a great church in Manhattan. He's now home with the Lord. And you know what happened? He refused to become bitter. And so that's what we united to do. When someone throws something back at you, remember how far you have fallen. Remember God's grace and what he's done for you that you don't get such a big head and I don't get a big head. This is all part of it. And that kind of supernatural love will change the world. When someone hates you and you refuse to reciprocate. Charleston, South Carolina, I know I've brought it up so many times. I tell you what, that blew me away. When that African-American church got there, and there's this guy, I don't even want to share that, I don't want to give any kind of grace to the guy because you know, I want to give him any kind of, not grace, but any kind of notoriety. He said, we forgive you. We forgive you. On the media, didn't know what to do with themselves. It was so powerful. There's Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The first martyr in the church, Stephen, they were saying all sorts of things about him. They were literally throwing stones at him. Pop! Pop, pop, he says, God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I see God, I see. And he began to declare God's grace and he over. What happens, not what happens to you, it's what happens in you. The Holy Spirit was in him. He looked beyond the offense. He actually rose higher. He died. But his death, his martyr, was perhaps one of the most important and the most deadly blows of the kingdom of darkness and the planet because it began to birth the growth of the church like never before. The apostle Paul sitting there condoning the throwing of stones. And I, I guarantee you, it messed with his head. This guy is showing no upsetness. He's showing love back at me. It broke the Apostle Paul, I believe, is a very instrumental point of him coming to know Christ and becoming one of the greatest evangelists that ever lived the planet, wrote a third of the New Testament because of a man named Stephen. Maybe stop trying to be right so much. It's not about you, it's about God. If you honor God with your thoughts and your words and your actions, God will give you the grace to overcome. You don't know how hard, it's easy for you to say, you don't know what this person does to me. No, I don't know, you know and I'm not God, in case you haven't noticed. But there's a promise in scripture. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says the following. 
No temptation, including being bitter, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common, common to man. But God is faithful, will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. That means I can't help myself. Yes, you can. No, I can't. Yes, you can. Let's be truthful here for a moment. The moment you said something 10 years ago to your brother or sister or whoever it was, and you knew just before you said it, don't say that. And you hear that little voice. You're like, I ain't gonna listen to that. You missed your opportunity. And then it gets very difficult. No temptation has overtaken you, but what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted in what you're, what you're able to, let's see, get this right here. Tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will make an avenue or a way of escape that you may be able to stand under it. So as believers in Christ, we don't have the trump card to put down. Well, I couldn't help myself. Yes, you can help yourself. The Bible says no temptation has overtaken you. So you don't have to get offended. You chose to be offended. And until you get that in your head, you're going to be a victim of other people the rest of your life. Controlled by your boss, controlled by your ex, controlled by your kids, controlled by your pastor, be controlled by all these people. They make me sick. That's right, they do because you let them. It's time to put your big boy pants on and big girl pants on, and it's time to take responsibility for your own emotions and give it to God and get over this nonsense about being offended. Now, I have to confess that I was a jerk last night to my wife, Sandra. I was. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm, I'm married. I'm, I'm a human being. I came back. I, jumped, I had too many donuts. <laughs> jumped on that trampoline thing. I was tired. And, I, you know, I came back. I was kind of just kind of, just kind of I don't like this. I don't like that. You know, she, and then meanwhile, and she, I'm throwing it at her, and, and I'm kind of being a jerk. So guess what? I gave in to it. So this happened last night. That's why I can barely walk right now. I mean, it's just, uh, no, I'm just kidding. She's awesome. She's really, she's really good about this. She's real good about being on We don't let things go on, by the way. I mean, we don't let things go on. Now, that I, I learned something. We've learned something very, very important. I used to, Scripture says in Ephesians, don't let the sun settle on your anger, right? So I took it literally. Oh, we got to solve this right here, right now. Meanwhile, we're completely exhausted. Our mental capacity has been decreased by 75%. <laughs> I've learned, let's make agreement that we will solve this when we have our senses back. Let's get some sleep. You wake up the next morning, what was the big deal? The toothpaste was squeezed in the middle. I mean, it's like, this buy, you have your own, I have my own. I mean, that's not what the problem was. I'm saying, this is what can happen. Sometimes the best thing to do is take a pause and say, okay, we're going to solve this later when I'm in a better mental state. Does that make sense, everybody? You know what? It's not worth it. Listen. Life is too short, and God's too loving. Why do you want to rip yourself and live with misery and bitterness? You think, think of that person. Who wants to live that way? And by the way, that's toxic for your health. It's not good for you. I'm going to ask that the worship team is going to make his way up. Remember something, folks. The world does not revolve around you. As, you know, it may be news for some of you. And this is something else. You can't save your face and see Jesus' face. Let me say that again. It's worth writing down. You cannot save your face and see Jesus' face. Sometimes you have to take the humble road and realize that you are not perfect and you've made a mistake. Own it. Own it and give it away. It's so much better to live. And finally, finally, the third point, going to be a lot quicker because I want to spend a lot of time on the first two is this. Treat people as God treats you. What, ha what would happen if God treated you like he treated people? Bible says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We were still screwed up. We weren't looking for him. He came looking for us, right? What does the Bible say here? When we understand God's glory and our broken story, it helps us to be humble. We understand God's glory in our broken story. You know what? I'm a pretty messed up person. It was not for God. Ephesians 4, 31 through 32 says the following. You can put it up there, please. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as types of all evil behavior. Instead, listen to this. Instead of being bitter, 
Let's be kind to each other. Tender hearted, forgiving one another just as God through Christ forgave you. Wow. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 44, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who what? Curse you. Do good to those that hate you and pray for those who spitefully, spitefully use you and persecute you. I've done a little test on it. It really does work. There's a person that was absolutely driving me crazy and I realized it was my problem. So I began to pray about that person. Father, I pray you bless such and such a person. Lord, bless them with a headache. No, no. Uh, God, bless them, Father. <laughs> bless them, Father. I pray you would give them success in their family. I started praying for them every day. It was a discipline. And all of a sudden, I started caring about the person. And I get rid of that toxin. It's like taking a snake bite and getting a knife and lancing them. Let that pus come out. Man, it doesn't do any good. Listen, let me say something to you. I said it all the time. You are not physiologically, psychologically, spiritually designed to hold bitterness and unforgiveness. God did not create humanity to hold that in their hearts. It's a toxin. It literally will put you in an early grave. It will give you unwarranted and unwanted sicknesses. It might bring on arthritis. I'm not saying you have arthritis, you're bitter, but all kinds of problems. Your immune system will be compromised because of the stress that done scientific studies now. They're saying what the Bible has said now, that bitterness and unforgiveness does you really, really bad. Now, you know what Nelson Mandela has said? He said this, and I agree with him. He says, not forgiving someone is like drinking poison and hoping they get sick. It does not work. Bitterness and unforgiveness will do you harm. It's not worth it. Some of you are trying to swim in the sea of God's love, and every time you get far, you, oh, oh, there's a hook in your mouth, and there's, a, there's that, the enemy's got this thing called a fishing pole. There's a hook in your mouth. It's called unforgiveness, and every time you try to go forward, you can't go any further because you have this unforgiveness. It's time to take the hook out of your mouth and say, God, I just released this person to you. What they did was wrong, but it's up to you now, God. And if you want to swim clear and free, it's time to get the... Un Some of you have like 10 or 20 hooks in your mouth. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. You got so much weight because you got so much bitterness. It doesn't... The person is living fine. Why be bitter? Be better. Turn your bitterness into betterness. It's an opportunity. Get rid of it. It's not worth it. You're not designed. Even atheist psychologists will tell you bitterness and unforgiveness is not good for you. We're not designed for it emotionally, physically, spiritually. Why hang on to this junk? It's going to put you sick. It's going to hurt your relationships. Colossians 3.13. I love this. This is important. Make allowances. What's an allowance? It's called cut some people some slack. Okay? Make allowances for each other's faults because you have them and I have them. Realize that I'm going to offend you and you're going to offend me. Let's make a decision ahead of time. I will not be offended by you. Please, we not be offended by me. I might say something and do something to offend you. So make a decision ahead of time that I'm imperfect, you're imperfect. Let's get some slack to each other. Make allowances for each other's faults and forgive. This is a hard one. What does it say? Anyone. Yes, your father, your mother, your ex, whoever. Teacher in school, anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you. So if you feel like it, you can forgive others. What does it say there? It says you what? You must. Why does it say you must? Because God loves us too much to see us destroy ourselves with bitterness and unforgiveness. You're not designed to have it. Why hold on to it? It's killing you. You're teaching your kids this stuff, your grandkids this stuff. Let go of it. You must forgive others. You know why God said that? He designed it. It's not good for you. Above all, listen to this, clothe yourselves 
with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. You know what? I have a jacket on right now. I had to pull this off the rack and put it on. I had to clothe myself. I didn't come naturally born with clothes on. Be thankful I have clothes on. Okay. <laughs> Listen, I had to put stuff on me to cover me. When you put on love, you make a choice. Love is a decision, not a feeling. Feelings encompass love, but love is a decision. It begins to know records are wrong, believes all things, hopes all things, no record of wrong. Read 1 Corinthians 13. It's not bitter, it's not envy, it's not act unbecoming, it's not rude. Believes all things, hopes all things. Listen, my friends, love is a decision, it is not a feeling. Oh, I'm out of love. No, you made a decision to be out of love. Love is a decision. Feelings come after. The decision comes first. Clothe yourself with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony. And harmony means not everyone's going to be just like you. Different, different things coming together, a mosaic. Ephesians 4, 1 through 4. Again, this is another parallel passage. It says pretty much the same thing, but it says it in a little bit different way. Therefore, the Apostle Paul said, I'm a prisoner serving the Lord. Beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the Spirit, binding yourself together with peace. For there's one body, one spirit, just that you've been called, one glorious hope of the future. If we're in the body of Christ and you're believers, we don't have the luxury to live in misery by having bitters and unforgiveness. If a person's hurt you, okay, maybe it's all right to stay away from but don't hold on to bitterness. Unforgiveness is toxic. It will hurt you, it will destroy you. Let's just summarize real quick what we talked about here this morning. We go right into the communion as we end. Remember, before you deal with a difficult person, you got to deal with you. It's not what happens to you, it's what happens in you. Right? The second thing we got to understand is, is how we respond often gives us our response back. How we treat others will come back at you. And the third thing is, forgive others like Christ forgave you. And there's no option, my friends. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, there's no option. Forgiveness is not an option, it's a command. And why is it a command? Because God loves us too much to destroy ourselves. And if you choose not to forgive, it's at your own peril. Hope you understand that, folks. It's not, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. All right, let's, uh, let's take a few months. Let's just pray right now. There's a lot. I know it's a heavy sermon today because it deals with life. And life is messy. Let's, let's bow our heads and pray before we get into the elements. Lord Jesus, I know that, Lord, I'm challenged today by my own sermon. And thank you, Father, that this stuff is coming from your word, which is your Bible, which is your truth. Father, you said you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Father, I just pray for freedom of relationships in this place right now. I pray you'd restore broken relationships between husbands and wives, between brothers and sisters, between other members of the church and people. Perhaps there may be some phone calls today. I don't know, but Lord, we just want to let go of this junk. It's not worth it, God. We're poisoning ourselves. You love us too much to see ourselves poisoned. So Father, we ask right now, we want to forgive these people that have offended us. We release them unto you, Father. We've heard your word today. We know it's true. Search our hearts, God. Lord, from now on, we want to be a blessing. We want to ask you. When we get offended, God, we want to come to you and ask you, God, what, why is it I'm offended? Why is it I'm offended? And then, Father, give us the grace to walk in the path you have for us. In Jesus' name. Hey, listen, maybe some of you, uh, I don't know where you are today, but there's someone that died for you. His name is Jesus. He loves you very much. You were born imperfect. You can't be good enough. I'm not good enough. You're not good enough. I don't care who you are. God's perfect. You're not. God loves us so much that he gave Jesus, that he came down. He says, I love you this much. And he hung on a cross for us to take away our sins because you can't pay for it. It's too much for you to pay for. I'm not good enough. You're not good enough. No one can get to the Father except through Jesus Christ. He's the vehicle we take to get to God. You may want to go to England, but you can't get to England unless you go on a boat or you go on an airplane. You have to get onto a fuselage of one of those two of the things. 
So you may believe in an airplane, you may believe in a boat, that's fine. I believe in it. You may even have the blueprints and discuss how the jet engine works and how thermodynamics, you may understand the whole theory of it, but until you buy that ticket, until you place your foot in that fuselage and submit yourself to that seat and let yourself be taken to that place, you're not gonna get there. And some of you know a lot about God, but you've never surrendered your life to God. There's only one way to God, and it's through Jesus Christ. The good news is He loves you. And that little flutter in your stomach is not an accident. God's talking to you right now. God loves you so much, and He gave everything. He loves you. He gave you Himself. And so I want to encourage you right now. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, if you could be so kind, and in reverence for other people. And in this moment, I'm going to ask everyone to stay still here for a moment, please. This is a very important opportunity for you. I'm going to ask you a question. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? If you haven't, there's going to come a day where you're going to have to answer to God. And there's only one way through God is through Jesus Christ. So if you'd like to, if you pray this prayer with, from your heart and mean it with your heart and confess with your mouth, I believe today can be a new day for you in Christ. If you want to pray quietly, you can do it right now. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross, as the Scripture says. I also believe that you rose again from the dead. I ask you right now to take away my sins. I confess that I am a sinner full of junk. I want to get rid of it. I don't want this stuff anymore. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And Lord, I'm not going to wait to get my act together because I can never get my act together. So I just, I come as I am right now. Everything, all my brokenness, I come to you right now. I ask you, Father, I give you the deed. I give you the, I give you the deed to the house of my life. I give you the ownership. My life is not my own. I hand my life back to you, for you're my creator, and you know what's best. Forgive me of my sins, and I give my life today to you. I declare that I'm not my own anymore. I'm yours. Give me the strength to walk in the path that you have for me today. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed, just quickly, so I know how to pray better. You say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today with you. Can you please show me a quick show of hands? Just real quick. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Come on. Let's be honest here. Thank you. Anyone else? So, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're being honest today. You know what? That's come on, guys. Let's thank God. He's working in people's hearts today. Come on. This is joining our family. Come on. Let's thank God this morning. Yeah. Forgive me, but this is the most important thing you could ever do in your life. You to give your life to God. On your seat, there's a little card here. It's called a connection card. Listen, if you can fill this out today and say, I accept that Christ as my Savior, just fill that out and give it, to, give it to one of those boxes. Or if you like, I'm going to ask the prayer team to make the weapons. Let's all stand. Let's get, oh, I need to take communion. I forgot all about that. Sit down. It's fun being up here. You can control people. Now that you've given your life to Christ, you can do something that He's done. It's called communion. Communion is communion with God. It happens through the cross of Jesus Christ by Him dying on the cross for you and I. And so when we come together, we remind ourselves what Christ has done. So, Jesus said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Take all of you eat. And Jesus also said, after He supped, this is the blood of my covenant. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Before we take this for a moment, there's some folks right now, you need to forgive some people. Let's take a moment right now. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I forgive these people that have offended me. I forgive my mother. I forgive my father. I forgive my ex. I forgive whoever it is. I forgive them in Jesus' name. I release them unto you you deal with this person. I'm taking the hook out of my mouth because you died on the cross and forgave me. I must forgive these people. And I forgive them in faith, not based upon feeling. I thank you that my feelings will follow my faith in Jesus' name. Take off. Drink. Now you can stand up. We're going to ask the prayer team to make their way down. If you prayed this prayer today, we have a gift for you, a Bible for you. Listen. We're not better than you. We're on this thing together, folks. God's perfect. We're on this together. So I encourage you to fill that out and put it in one of those boxes or one of the people up here. Prayer team, please make your way up. Esteban and the worship team are going to lead us one last song. As we do that, you may come forward for prayer. After that, you can leave quietly. If you need more prayer, we can pray as long as you like. Okay? Thanks.
believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ our Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. God's grace be upon you. May his love shine upon you. May his healing be upon you. Go in his peace and go in his name. Let's walk in freedom together. If you need to have prayer, we open these up. Otherwise, we dismiss you. You're welcome to come to 101. God bless you, everybody. See you Wednesday night.